Okay, today, March 17th, 2021, I, Maya Hill, the interviewer, will be interviewing Mr. Nate Bynum. Location is over Zoom. This oral history will be for the Black Student Alumni Oral History Project. So welcome, Mr. Bynum, to this interview. I'm so excited to be taking it out taking the time to interview you and to hear about your story and your time at Penn State. So just to jump right in, could you tell us where you're from and when you were born? I was, I am from, originally from Philadelphia, PA. I was born um, September 11th, 1947. Um, yeah, so, so in growing up in, uh, in Philadelphia, um, how were your experiences and what was your community like um, as a child? So talking about like elementary school, um, middle school, and even your high school experiences. Can you, can you talk about that? Like what was the atmosphere like growing up in Philadelphia? What was your home life like? What did your parents do? Um, and, and how did that help you grow into, you know, who you are today? Well, the first thing, okay, I grew up, my mother went to Hampton. She was a Hampton alumna. Um, my father was a World War II vet. Um, I think he went to Drexel for, um, to be a technician. My mother ended up teaching. She didn't teach until um, probably almost my last year in high school. My father was a machinist at Westinghouse. He was a first class machinist. He was, just about the only black person in that group. He worked on the first atomic submarine. Um, my mother used to have meetings with the Hampton alumni. And I was like, what's Hampton alumni? Mm -hmm. And um, I remember one time telling my mother and my father that I'll be glad when um, these 12 years of school are done. I was in about second grade. She said, well, you're going to school after those 12 years. And I said, what? I said, 12 years is long enough. You know, I was <laughs> like seven years old. So 12 years, more than 12 years was forever. Um, my neighborhood was a village. Anybody on my block had permission to discipline me if I did something wrong. I lived in West Philly on 61st Street between 61st and Media. Um, I went to Hannah Elementary School. I went there from first through fourth or fifth grade. Then I got recommended for this school that they were just starting up. It was, it hadn't started yet, but they um, took me, they, I remember they sent a letter home to my parents asking if I could go to the school. It was called Masterman. Um, so I went there for fifth and sixth grade and then seventh, eighth and ninth grade. Uh, Masterman had, it was about one, it had people from the neighborhood. The neighborhood was Black and Puerto Rican. And then the people that came from out of the neighborhood were mainly white. And the largest portion of them were um, Jewish and Ukrainian. So um, very early, I got used to being in a predominantly um, um, Caucasian environment. Um, so I went to Masterman. Masterman only went to ninth grade and we um, did seventh and eighth grade in one year, they accelerated us. And um, after ninth grade, you could go to any high school you wanted, but everybody was encouraged to go to either Central or Girls High. You know, Central was all boys and Girls High, obviously it was all girls. Um, they had a gang culture in um, Philadelphia. I was influenced by that, you know, the way you carried yourself, everything was influenced by that. Central kind of balanced that out. You know, I got bored at Central after Masterman. I would cut class and go in the library and read things on the whatever, whatever subject the class was in. So as a result, my grades at Central were not great, but they had these, um, um, standard exams that they gave the college boards. Mm -hmm. I did real well, almost had perfect in the math and did real well in the English. And they had something called the uh, national merits. And I was a national merit. Um, I think I was a semifinalist in that. You had to be in the top 99. And 
you know, at Central, in my graduating class, there were about 100. We had the most of any school in the country, so it didn't seem like it was a big thing. But it turns out that's what got me into college. Wow. Um, I um, played a little sports. I loved um, reading. I read, um, I taught myself algebra when I was in third grade. I love math. You know, when I got algebra in college, it just, in, um, at Central, it seemed just really slow. And I didn't get, I didn't get good grades, but I tutored the other students in it, you know, cause it was just moving too slow. Mm -hmm. um, but the environment at Central really prepared me for the environment at a place like Penn State because it was predominantly white. Um, you know, so I had a balance. I had my neighborhood, I grew up in West Philly, a black neighborhood, we had gangs, you know, we had little, mm, for lack of a better term, scuffles. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I've been shot at, I was stabbed, you know, and again, that was just part of being black and growing up in Philly. But it turned out even at Central, we had different cultures in the black people. We had blacks that we kind of considered, I consider bougie, but you know, I got along with everybody. And um, um, that was my purpose. Now, fortunately for me, I spent my summers in the South. Mm -hmm. um, after a certain age, uh, I would go down Virginia. I looked forward to it. And I was out in the country and I learned the value of hard work, respect for my elders, respect for women. Mm -hmm. A lot of things that you normally don't run into on an everyday basis, you know, in, in, in an urban environment. But down there, it was expected. It was um, um, emphasized. So that was my experience growing up. Yeah. So even in growing up in a all um, Black community and, and then going to a diverse school, did you experience any discrimination that maybe one, two things that maybe uh, kind of stuck with you throughout your time at college or kind of, you know, stuck with you throughout life that you experienced, um, especially during the time in which uh, you grew up, it was a lot of racial tension during that time. So, and in some, in some places, like, you know, schools were still segregated. So uh, did you experience any discrimination? And, and then how did your parents handle that and prepare you for those encounters, if you, if you experienced any? Um, I can't say that it was overt, anything overt that I experienced. Um, the only discrimination that overt discrimination that I experienced was when I was in the South. Um, when I went to the movie theater, I was getting ready to go sit down. They said, no, you can't sit there. And I said, why not? We had to go up in the balcony. And actually, at that time, I thought that was pretty cool because I liked being up in the, you know, being <laughs> up in the balcony. Um, the um, people down there, though, weren't, I was in Virginia, so it wasn't as bad as maybe being in a place like Mississippi or Alabama. You know, everybody, to me, appeared to get along. Mm -hmm. I experienced more overt racism at Penn State than I did in the South. Wow. So my parents didn't really do anything to prepare me for it. They, the only thing is was when I was getting ready to go down Virginia, they told me that some of the things that I did at home, I couldn't do down there. But, um, you know, I was young. It didn't, you know, you, you adapt much better when you're really young. So it was just the way it was. That's the way it was. Yeah. Um, so you transitioning into like your time, how you got to Penn State, how you heard about Penn State. You mentioned that you are a national merit and you did well. And then you also mentioned that your parents were educated. Um, your mom going to Hampton and your dad um, going to Drexel. So and you also mentioned that your mom kind of said, you're going back to school. Like that's something that you are going to do. So how did Penn State come on your radar knowing that you're, like I said, your mom went to Hampton and um, your dad went to Drexel. So how did you decide to, to, to go to Penn State and, and how did you hear about Penn State? Um, in the newspaper, 
Penn State played Ohio State in football. I was just learning how to play football. So I was soaking in everything I could. Penn State played Ohio State in football. Penn State was not a national power at the time. Um, Ohio State was number three in the nation and Penn State beat them. And I said, wow, because all that time <clears throat> I've been thinking maybe Villanova or a lot of the guys at my school went to Princeton um, or, or schools like that. But Penn State, that's how Penn State really got on my radar. Mm -hmm. And some of my best friends, one of my best friends went to Penn State. You know, everybody was applying to Michigan State, Cheney, um, Lincoln, Michigan State, UCLA, and a few applied to Penn State. So um, that's how Penn State got on my radar. So I started researching Penn State. I was either, I was in the art. So I was either gonna be an architecture major. And if um, I decided I didn't like that, I was going into electrical engineering. I love math. And they said, electrical engineering is nothing but applied calculus. So that appealed to me. Mm -hmm. um, one more thing that, appealed to me is they had hybrid computers. There was no such thing as a PC. They didn't even have mainframes the way we look at them now. Mm. My mother told me one day that they had machines that could do math. From that point on, I was absolutely fascinated with the idea of a machine that could do math. Mm. I found out about the labs that they had at Penn State. So I said, I'm, I'm gonna apply to Penn State. And that's what I did. I stayed out of school a year. I was, I had badly damaged um, my right knee. Um, you imagine your knee pointing forward and your foot pointing back. It tore everything up in my knee. I was told that I would walk with a cane for the rest of my life. And um, I said, well, I've got to do something, you know, to get myself ready to play football at Penn State. I thought you could just, you know, do that and I said I gotta get ready for electrical engineering so what I did is I took a lot of the achievement tests that the national um that the um, college boards had I did real well in the achievement tests I said I'm gonna use these to get into college because you know, I knew my grades uh, you know my grades I cut class too much to have good grades <laughs> you know and I, I wasn't cutting to go party I'd cut and go to the library and read you know and some of the instructors knew it and so they would test me individually, you know, orally, and I did well in those. So in those courses, I did well. Um, but I was, you know, and one of my best friends went to Penn State, and that influenced me. So when you arrived at Penn State's campus as <laughs> a freshman, after looking it up and doing your research, what was your first kind of experience like when you walked on did you think it was uh did you think it was how you envisioned it um before when you looked it up or was it completely different from how you envisioned it and um noting that you were a student athlete so how was that <laughs> and, and and what were some of the thoughts that were going through your head when your parents kind of dropped you off at Penn State my parents did not drop me off okay <laughs> I had, we didn't have a car growing up no um, um, my, um, I had two suitcases, I filled them with clothes, um, you know, we weren't wealthy growing up, you know, there was three of us, I had two brothers, and my father had experienced issues at work, they were on strike a lot, you know, there was a period when he was out of work for 18 months, you know, so, I went up to Penn State with money for a bus ticket and $20. Mm -hmm. I got on the Greyhound bus and it dropped me off um, when, when they said we were in State College. I felt like I was in the middle of nowhere. I looked around and excuse my language, but I said, where the hell am I? <laughs> you know, I looked around. There was none of the buildup that you see now. The bus station was on Atherton Street. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a building, one of Penn State's buildings is there now. And it was just like kind of a shack, a long shack. And I looked around and 
So I asked somebody, I was my I was supposed to go to South Falls. And if I'm taking too long, let me know. Um, my my dorm was Cross Hall in South Halls. So I asked somebody where Cross Hall was, because I, I was very budget minded and I, I I said, this little hick place does not have cabs. <laughs> I didn't think they had taxis. And they didn't have that, you know, the bus service, the loops, and there were no buses other than the bus in and out of town. So I looked around and I said, where's Cross Hall? And I, somebody said, well, what dorm area is that? I said, that's South Halls, I believe. They said, well, you go down to College Avenue and it's about eight blocks. I said, can I, or I said, can I walk there? And he looked at the suitcases that I had and they said, you should take a cab. Mm -hmm. so, so I saw a cab and I asked him, how much would it cost me to go from here to South Pole. He said 60 cents. That was the cab fee. I reached in my pocket. I had 75 cents and a $20 bill. I said, okay, take me to South Cross Hall. <laughs> I, I landed at Cross Hall. I started in the summer term. That's why, you know, it was so different. It was very different in the summer term. I landed at Cross Hall. I went in. And um, the RA met me and he said, what's your name? And I gave him my name. I was on the third floor or fourth floor, I believe. They took me up to my floor. I had a white roommate. I introduced myself. He was pretty cool. He was all right, real friendly guy. And um, I, you know, he had picked out his bed because he got there first in class. So I put my stuff in the closet. I sat on my bed. I looked out the window and I saw a sea of white. And I said, you know, where in the world am I? Mm -hmm. You know, then all of a sudden, I saw this car pull up in the lot across the street, the Pollock Halls, and two black girls got out and one brother. Well, I happened to know that I knew one of the sisters. I was in all city choir when I was in Philly. And I knew her brother because he had I run track against him. So I ran down the steps, shot up the hill, across the parking lot, and said, what's happening? The two girls were Marguerite Willis and Merle Nimmons. You may have um, interviewed Merle, but they started the same summer that I started. And her brother was you know, bringing them up. Mm -hmm. um, They took us on a tour of campus. They showed us around. This was orientation week. Um, everything was white. I didn't see hardly any black people. Every day going to the dining hall, hall I went to breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, there was a group of guys on my floor that would walk over. So I would walk over with them, walk up, you know, in the dining hall. We sit down and eat and BS, walk out together, and we did that all week. The next week, you know, classes started. There was, there were no black people in any, I had placed out of a lot of things. There were no black people in any of my classes. Mm. Um, we had chemistry, which was a four credit course. It was, uh, you know, lab. Um, I remember walking in, it was this gigantic lecture hall. And there was, I mean, you, you know the kind if you mm -hmm. went to Penn State, there was, I was the only black person in there. So I sat down and I listened and, you know, I got a syllabus. I didn't pay attention to the syllabus. I just went back. Math was a little different. I had uh, my first calculus course. Um, English was depressing, but I loved the reading that they gave us. And it was depressing because my first paper, I got a D and I thought it was good. <laughs> Eventually that improved. I learned that I really had to learn to write. And so that, that, that served me well. Um, but in, meanwhile, socially, it was, I'd go to class. I, I mean, I'd go to the dining. And then I noticed there was a table that was a bunch of black people sitting at the table. There was maybe, eight black people, but I was walking in and out with these, with the um, Caucasians 
And it turned out there was two other black people in my dorm, black guys in my dorm. So, you know, I tried to make contact with them. one of them looked at me like, um, okay, why are you talking to me? The other one was pretty friendly. Um, the white guys on my um, floor were trying to be liberal. They said, you know, like one guy came up, he was smiling. He said, do you like the Temptations? I love the Temptations. <laughs> I said, well, I like the Beatles. You know, I didn't <laughs> like the Beatles, but I was just saying that to, <laughs> to answer him. So finally, you know, we were going. So one day I walked, instead of walking out with this group of um, people from my floor, I walked over to the black table and I said, how you doing? My name is Nate. And I introduced myself to everybody at the table. There were maybe four or five sisters and um, it was like five sisters and like maybe a couple of guys. So I introduced myself and, you know, we, um, um, so I would say hello to them and then leave. After a while, um, I would finish my food first and go and sit with them. And after that, I didn't even go bother going over with the guys from my floor. I just went over by myself, got my food, and sat at the table with my people. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my initial experience at Penn State. You know, it was like it was it was overwhelming, but it didn't it it wasn't overwhelming to the point where it was going to um, stop me. You know, it was just like, wow, this, this is, this is insane. Mm -hmm. um, so what was, what was your major? What did you decide to major in? And um, I know you say you like math and, and science and you were pretty good at math and science. So what did you decide to major in? And did you start summer term of 68 or 69? Neither. I started summer term of 66. 66, excuse me. Okay. Yeah, I saw it started. Um, if you talk to Carol Murrow, in fact, mm -hmm. we were going, we went to college at the same time. She went to Eastern Michigan. Mm -hmm. You know, we were in like um, high school and I'd go out and see them. And she said, I'm going to Eastern Michigan, but I might go to Penn State. Mm -hmm. um, we started college the same time. I don't know if you talked to Joan Brown, mm -hmm. but her name is Joan Sloan. Um, Yolanda was probably already there. Um, I'm trying to think who you may have spoken to that was that started at the same time. Maybe um, Merle, um, and maybe Merle. We started at the same time, so I started in summer of '66. Um, and class class was interesting. Going to classes was interesting. The math class. My first exams in math and chemistry, um, my score was under 40 out of 101 and under 20 um, out of 100 in the other. I did not really know how to study. I would read and read science for pleasure. And the coursework wasn't hard. It's just that I didn't put in the work. Mm -hmm. And so it was at that point, I saw one of your questions was, did, did the racial um, issues um, make you want to go home? No, I wanted to go home. I said, looks like I'm not made for college. You know, I called my mom, I talked to her. She said, well, stick out the term. So what I did is I stopped socializing at lunch. You know, I would socialize and eat. I went back and started reading. You know, I, I did every problem in whatever chapter. A lot of times they give us partial chapters to read. I'd read the whole chapter. And I do every problem, not every other problem. And I found and I learned that because I had a elective um, in psychology. And they had this example of a monkey that did those twist problems puzzles and the more they did it, the faster they did it, et cetera. I said, I'm gonna apply that to um, math. The more problems I did, the easier they got until they were, until I was helping other people in the class. Mm -hmm. I had a chemistry test that was extremely difficult. 
And, and in the lecture, the, the instructor in the lecture was so disappointed that he said, we are going to give a test on the same material again. The highest grade in that class was like a 68. This was with 400 people. Mm. I had maybe a 30. So I made sure that I studied for this test. Um, we came, and this is, um, I'm, I'm telling you about this because this is what told me that I was going to be all right. They had, when they graded the test, they had four or five piles on the front. And um, um, they had the people come up and get their exam. So of course, having had the negative experiences I had at the beginning, I went to the C pile. My name wasn't in there. And I said, this, this test, this exam was easy. I couldn't have gotten a D, but I looked in the D pile. It wasn't in there. And then there was this big F pile, even though it was a makeup exam, I looked through there and it wasn't there. I went to the B pile because I, I thought I had killed that exam. It wasn't <laughs> there. And I looked in the A pile, which was rather small and it wasn't there. And I was like, oh shoot, they must have kicked me out of class. <laughs> So everybody had gotten their, their tests and the thing was empty. And the instructor had some papers in his class. He said, now there's three of you that couldn't find your exams. And I was like, oh man, them people must have. And he said, if you were one of the people that couldn't find your exam, raise your hand. I said, damn, he's going to embarrass me. You know, in front of all <laughs> so when I raised my hand, I said, bunk it. That's not what I said, but I said, bunk it. You know, I raised my hand. And um, um, he said, this is your, um, Nathaniel Bynum, this is your paper. This is your, your test results. And then he looked at me. He said, you had the highest grade in the class. I had a hundred and they had these extra um, questions for um, bonus. And you could actually get like something like 118. I had 118 on that test out of a hundred. I had the highest grade in that test. It was supposed to be a difficult chemistry test. I wasn't so much proud um, that I got the best test. I was ecstatic that a black person had the best grade in that class. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I went back and I went, I went to the, the, what I call the black table in the dining hall. I showed it to him. I said, look at that. I had the best and it was 400 and some people in that class and nobody did better. And that's when I knew that I was going to be all right academically. You know, mm -hmm. I had other challenges academically, but they had nothing to do with the difficulty of the work. Mm -hmm. Well, that does bring a sense of, of strong pride when you get the highest and you get the bonus points. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. That, that is amazing. Um, so coming to Penn State, were you a football athlete already or how did you transition into be, becoming an athlete saying that you play sports and, and that you also injured your knee. So how did you transition into becoming an athlete? And then also um, you could share more about like your experience as an athlete. What was it like to be one of the few um, African-American men on the football team? What was it, what was your interactions like with the coach? Um, and then also what was your interaction with the rest of the university? Because football at Penn State is really, is a, is a big thing. So how were you even looked at now that you were on a, you know, you, you were you were an athlete, you know? Okay, now as a freshman, well, fall term came. I, let me tell you how I transitioned. First, I was told that I would not be able to, um, never be able to run. Um, they told me that I would walk with a cane for the rest of my life. I decided while I was, still at Central my, my last year, that I was going to start running. And I was forbidden to do that by the doctors, and I did it anyway. I ran on this wooden track, 
And all my boys would laugh at me because I'd fall off every third or fourth step because I had absolutely no sense of um, feeling in my right leg. They had cut and done so much that I had, you could stick pins anywhere from my thigh down to my ankle and I would feel it. Um, when I got to Penn State, um, the guys on my floor looked at me and they thought I was an athlete. I played basketball. I was really spastic playing basketball because I hadn't done it. I hurt my knee when I was 15. I was now 18. Mm -hmm. I hadn't done any sports for three years, nothing. Uh, I started playing basketball again and that got me back into it. I started feeling more in my leg. I got my coordination back and I had this dream of playing football at Penn State. And like I said, like, like I may have mentioned before, I thought it was like high school. You just go out and you know, they sprint and you do this and you do this. I had no idea that these guys on scholarship were the best of the best. They were people that were all this and all that. So um, I went up to the office and I said, um, I want to go out for football. The secretary looked up at me as if to say, yeah, you and everybody else that walks in here, you know, thinks that they can play football on this level. But she took my name, had me fill out the school. Coach Paterno called my dorm. The guys on my floor were excited. You know, because like you said, football's a big thing. And they said they were banging up like the, in the dorms then. The, there was a phone in the hall for every four rooms. Um, so the person that answered it, you know, they were banging on the door and they said, guess what? Coach Paterno, Joe Paterno is calling for Nate. They were banging on my door. I said, you opened the door. I said, what do you want? They said, um, Coach Paterno is on the phone. He wants to talk to you. They were all excited. So I was cool. I said, oh, okay, you know, I'll get it. You know, like I was inside, <laughs> yeah. So he talked to me for a few minutes and asked me about my experiences and all. And so he arranged for me to have a physical, you know, for preseason and it was the end of the summer term. I had the physical, the doctor looked at me and he said, um, you know, your knee is still pretty unstable. And um, he looked at me, he said, you know, you're a little light in, well, I won't say what he said, you're a little light in the rear end. <laughs> you know, he said, your boys are pretty big. You sure you wanna do this? I said, yeah, I wanna do this. So he um, passed me, he let me, um, he let me pass. I did everything I could to condition myself. I went out as a walk-on. Now, a walk-on is probably the lowest thing you can be, you know, in, 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 at, at the college level. There were maybe 40 or 50 walk-ons. There were 21 guys, I believe, on scholarship. So they were the ones that they looked at, you know, 21 freshmen on scholarship. Mm -hmm. And there were these 40 or 50 walk-ons that were hoping that they might make it. So what I did is I had a work ethic from one growing up because a lot of times my dad would take me to his part-time jobs when he was on strike and then being down South, you know, you didn't go down there and play all the time. You went down there and work. So I had a, I, I was, I had a good work ethic instilled in me. So every dirty, if I had to hold dummies, I held dummies. When they needed a tackling dummy, I, um, um, I volunteered. You know, other guys would kind of walk away from it because these guys were a little bit bigger and stronger and they hit you really hard. And I got used to that. So one day I was um, running plays um, and one of the defensive linemen looked at me and he said, you know what, and this was a white guy. He was from actually Woodbury, which is not far from where I live now. He ended up making All-American and he played pro. He's one of the owners of the um, Sharks um, indoor uh, arena football team. But he said, he looked at me, you know, I was supposed to be running a trap. I didn't know what a trap was. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I was really, really naive. He said, you haven't played a lot of football, have you? And I started to like lie and I didn't, I said, no. He said, you got a lot of heart and I'm gonna help you. And he helped me. The upshot is that 
out of those 40 or 50 or maybe more walk-ons that went out, three of us made it. And I was one of the three that made it. Now, um, a lot of people didn't know my name because I wasn't one of those people that was recru um, recruited. The guys, I lived in, then I lived in East Halls. I moved to East Halls. Most of the athletes were in North and West Hall. But my um, um, freshman year, the rest of my freshman year from fall through spring was in East Halls. I lived in Brumba. Um, and no, nobody knew I was on a football team at first until one day I was going to practice. There was a bunch of guys up there, to, you know, and they saw me um, in a uniform going to practice and they said, Nate, are you on the team? And I, I said, yeah. And I kind of became a celebrity, mm -hmm. not, not a big celebrity, but amongst the white people, the, the, the Caucasians, they were like, oh yeah, he's on the football team, he, you know, and they would come up and ask me questions and all. In the classroom, it didn't make that much difference because again, since I wasn't one of the named athletes, I wasn't one of the ones that they walked through um, registration so I could get perfect um, you know, classes at the perfect time. A lot of the instructors didn't know. Um, some one or two of them found out, but my calculus instructor, I really disliked him because I did the first exam we had. Again, I had learned to um, study. This was not an exam that normally um, a freshman would uh, think. And uh, he looked at me and said, you have no business in this class. Mm. And he said, I said, why? And he looked at me and said, you know, your kind um, normally doesn't do well mm. in things that are more technical. Maybe you should, you know, be a, I don't know what he was told, you know, what he was saying. And I really didn't care because all of a sudden, everything that I saw turned red. <laughs> I saw red. I had another technical class. And when the guy saw me in the class, he said, what are you doing in here? And I said, this is a class I have scheduled. And he said, you know, are you sure that you want to be in this class? I said, I'm absolutely positive. He said, what's your major? I said, electrical engineering. He said, what are you doing in electrical engineering? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wasn't realize, I didn't realize at the time, I said, they must have some secret information on me or something. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention to the fact that I was because I hadn't just experienced that kind, of that kind of discrimination at Central. This was my first real experience and I had a whole lot more. That was just an example. And anybody that went to school at that time, some of them experienced, a lot of them experienced that kind of um, attitude from the instructors at one time or another. They didn't have any of the programs like EOP or anything like that. You know, we were just students going to school, trying to, you know, trying to make it. So how did that racial climate, climate um, on within your classes, but also um, I'm wondering if it had a play on the football field as well. You mentioned that no, another white um, guy kind of helped you out and then yeah. you were able to stay on the team. So did that racial climate only stay within your academic realm or did it also influence um, the football field as well, knowing that there were so many, so so few, excuse me, so few of you guys, um, African-American men who were athletes on the team? Well, the team was a reflection of the coach. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say this, Coach Paterno, was one of the best people I have ever known in my life. You know, not just a football coach, just but just a person, a genuine, caring person. Now, sometimes if you heard him talk to us on the field, 
we might like, oh man, this guy is, you know, but that that he treated everybody like that, but he treated everybody fairly. Um, and he gave me an opportunity. He saw that I did have a little bit of ability. I did have some ability. I just never developed it and that I was willing to work. And that was his big thing. The uh, important thing to him was your work ethic. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the guys on the team, that was, that was important to them. Like the guys that they didn't like, didn't have anything to do with color, had to do with, you know, some guys had this prima donna attitude. And of course, all of them were the best in their high school and not the, just their high school, the best in their league. Some of them were um, super athletes in three or maybe sometimes even four sports and everybody looked up to them. And some of the guys carried that attitude. They're like, well, I'm special. Mm -hmm. Well, guys on the team, especially like the guys that weren't freshmen at that time, you know, kind of taught them a lesson, you know, taught them. And they looked at the guy, the guy that helped me was a guy that was an upperclassman. And he looked at the people, he helped another person. And that person was what happened to be Caucasian. Mm -hmm. um, and they looked at your work ethic, how hard you worked. And, you know, if you didn't work hard, the guys on scholarship that didn't work hard, they were basically ignored, you know. Um, you'll hear a lot of stories about walk-ons who have made it at Penn State and ended up being really, really good. Um, one of the three guys, um, the other two guys, one of them made All-American as a defensive back, you know, because he came ready, ready, ready to put in the work. So on the field, it did not affect me. Um, later on, people said Paterno was prejudiced. He was not. There were guys that came that were superstars where they came from, but because they were amongst a lot of other superstars, they didn't get the play that they thought they should get. You know, um, the other guys just didn't care. You know, so on the field. It was all good, at, at, at least as far as I could see. Um, I'll tell you an experience that I had. I went to a bar, you know, of course I wasn't old enough. And um, some, and it was a, a bar on College Avenue. I don't think it's, you know, it was called the My Oh My. And I walked in, I sat down, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't there to drink. I was just there for the vibe. I walked in and some um, some guys made a comment. And in that comment was several times the N-word. You know, and they shouldn't be here and they shouldn't be that. So I walked up to the guy and I was going to say to him, you should be more careful of what you say and who you say it around. And it was one of the linemen from the football team saw what was happening. He came up to me and grabbed, grabbed my shoulder and him and one, another one of the guys on the football team said, don't worry about it, Nate, we'll take care of it. Mm. I'm not sure what they did, but the guy, guy came over and apologized and then left. <laughs> so, you know, Football team was like its own fraternity. Everybody looked out for everybody. And I was running back. They were linemen, so the linemen protected the the backs. You know, they blocked for the backs, and that's exactly what they did in, on that occasion. Wow, that that is that you know that's an amazing highlight to to bring forth even in um, this conversation because knowing the time within the country and how racially divided it was in the '60s and also amongst on university campuses, including Penn State. So to hear that your experience as an athlete did not, um, there, were, there were not, they were not similar in, in aligned to um, other racial experiences that you had even within your um, classes. So just to transition to student activism, where did you find yourself as 
you know, if you if you saw yourself as an activist, where did you kind of find yourself amongst the group? So whether it be the Douglas Association, whether it be going to protests or uh, uh, different events, where did you find your placement in that? And um, kind of describe maybe one or two experiences that you had that um, involved you being some in, in some sort or, or, or another an activist. Okay. I need to go back to summer term. Guys, Caucasians ride by and call out their window, you know, A and the N word. You know, they would throw stuff at us. We had a guy, he used to call Whiplash. He was a brother, he was, and he was walking up, um, you know, from McGlanahan's, you know, on that um, street that goes down the College Avenue. And he was jumped by a group of um, Caucasians. Well, it ended up that three or four of them were badly hurt and were left laying on the ground. Mm -hmm. They didn't know Whiplash was from the city. <laughs> and I'm not gonna give you his real name, but that's what we call him, Whiplash was from the city. Mm -hmm. And two of them were, they walked away, but when he walked away, so he went, got the campus patrol. The campus patrol's reaction was, um, okay, well, keep this quiet. Don't, we wouldn't want anything like this to get out. Mm. There were a number of incidents where people were attacked, especially men were physically attacked. And um, the campus patrol's reaction was always the same thing. Well, you know, we gotta keep this quiet. We don't want anything like this get in the paper or, um, you know, we wouldn't want any bad publicity. And I said, something's wrong with this picture. So went through freshman year, I pledged a fraternity, a black fraternity. Black fraternities and sororities kind of gave us a home. Um, the guy that was our poll mark, our president, he went, had gone to a meeting with some other black students. And he came back and told us about this organization called the Douglas Association that they were about to start. This was Fred Phillips. Um, it would have been great if he could have been a good man. He passed away not too long ago. But Freddie P and um, Raleigh Denby and Rick Collins, you know, mainly Freddie P, Raleigh Denby, and another guy, a guy. Raleigh Denby was one of Rick's um, frat brothers. And I, I think Rick might have been originally, uh, he, he, he was ahead of me. So he might have been one of the, they started this group called the Douglas, the Frederick Douglas Association. I keep putting my phone down and you can't see. Um, the Fred, Frederick Douglas Association. And he told us about it and all, wow, you know, that's pretty cool. So I remember we went to the first meeting and some of the people were relative, were really radical. Some of them already, you know, this was in 19, maybe 67 or 68. I can't, I, I gotta get the timeline together, but um, they were radical. And um, then we talked about protesting. So we started doing some things. You probably saw the picture of us putting up the brick wall mm -hmm. in the um, president's office. We came up with these demands. We came up and we wanted to see, Eric Walker was the president. We wanted to see the president. President did not want to see us. Um, there had been riots. That was right after a, a first summer of a lot of riots in some of the cities. You know, I think we were influenced by that. Mm -hmm. But we were still trying to do the right thing. And we said, okay, we need to do something that'll have, make a statement. And I'm sure in your other interviews you heard about, so about a hundred black students each um, had got a brick mm -hmm. and we marched to Old Main, <laughs> you should have seen the people looking at us like, what are they doing with bricks in their hands? 
And Ray Skinner, myself, and another brother, we were in engineering. Mm -hmm. So they said, we want you up front so you can make sure we put the, these bricks up right. And um, uh, Rick Collins, uh, Rick Collins may have been the president at that time, I'm not sure. And um, so you saw that picture in the Collegian, it was myself, Ray and Rick. And we were building the brick wall in front of, we walked into Eric Walker's desk and like people in Old Main appeared to be terrified. They didn't have any idea of what we were gonna do with those bricks. And we built the wall. And we advertised that that symbolized the wall that was up between the black students and the administration. And doing that gave me a lot of pride and it made me look at everything in an entirely different manner. You know, um, it made me really glad that I had gone to Penn State and the reason is Penn State is a microcosm of the real world. You know, I could have gone to, I would, could have gone to Hampton, could have gone to maybe another um, predominantly historically black um, college or university, but I chose Penn State. And one to go to, this goes back, one of the reasons I chose Penn State, I knew it was predominantly, you know, a, a very few of us there. And I said, that's the way the world is. You know, you know, it's easy to be black at a black school. It's a whole different ball game at a school like Penn State or Pitt or even Temple. You know, although they had more, a larger percentage of black people, I believe, than we did. Um, so that gave me pride. And we started coming up with other things that we could do to um, call the attention to our plight. We um, demonstrated on the old main steps. Now that led to an incident that I told you about in our other, another conversation. Coach Paterno saw pictures of the people who were protesting. He saw me, so he called down to Kappa House and said, asked me, he said, Nate, um, how would you like to come to my house for dinner? And he said, you know, bring one of your frat brothers. So one of my frat brothers really was, he had gone out for football. He said, the first time somebody tackled him up there, he said, that was enough. He wasn't <laughs> gonna do that anymore, but he wanted to go. So him and myself, his name was John Edwards. Um, we used to call him Beasley, um, but that was John Edwards. He was a year or two ahead of me. So we went to Paterno's house we had dinner and we said, you know, we had a conversation. And a lot of times back then, liberal whites would say, you know, like, some of my best friends are black, you know, that, 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 that. And you got used to that. We say, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, um, his attitude was, he didn't care if you were black. He had, he had some daughters. If his daughter came home and she had wanted to marry a black man. All he cared about was whether he was going to take care of her, treat her right, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we had this dinner, we had a conversation, just he had a um, spirit about him that's hard to describe unless the only, I've been around other people that had the kind of spirit. Um, um, what's his name? Jimmy um, Carter. If you've ever heard of him, he was a, a president at one time of the United States and Nelson Mandela, they had that kind of, they had this aura about them that is really positive. Um, Paterno had a lot of that. That's probably why he was able to recruit good people. That's why people thought he was genuine. So he finally got down to why he had invited us. So he said, you know, what are y'all trying to accomplish? He knew about the demands. We told him what we were trying to accomplish. And he said, okay. And we talked about him a little bit. Why did we want this? Why did we want that? Um, how is it going to benefit us, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we told him. And we told him about how hostile it was there, how people had been attacked, how brothers 
would wait at the suites or down the frat houses so that when sisters left the um, library, they could call one of the frat houses or one of the sorority suites and say, you know, they're getting ready to leave and some of the brothers could escort them home because it was, you know, not a really friendly environment. It wasn't overtly hostile and 19 times out of 20, you could walk home with no incident or um, the worst incident would be somebody drive by in a car and holler something, but still that can be unnerving. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were about, so you'll find that the black people from that era are extremely tight. It's like it was a family. So that's what got a lot of us through the family environment that we created for ourselves. And the activism grew out of that. And our participation in the activism grew out of that. We, um, you all might have also seen the things where we went on Beaver, went to Beaver Stadium during halftime to protest what was going on. And there were comments that, well, oh, maybe we should hang some of them. You know, there were all kinds of comments like that. I don't know how serious they were, but you know, when you are, 19, 20, 21. When you hear things like that, you take it seriously and you watch out for yourself. And then there's some things that we did, probably shouldn't go on record. I can tell you about them another time. <laughs> what we ended up doing, the result of our activities, greatly, and most of the attacks, actual attacks were from people, not from the university, or from the surrounding area. Well, we worked out a way of stopping those attacks. And if you ever want more clarity on that, I will give it to you when we're not on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that will be great. Um, so just one more question, um, I guess that will, about activism and then going into the black community and like that social life that and community that was established as you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. What, what did you feel when you heard um, that the campus patrol were, weren't going to do anything about the incidents that were happening to Black students? What did you feel when um, you realized that the, the administration wasn't paying you guys any attention and they weren't listening to the demands? They weren't, you know, moving on behalf of you guys. What was, what, what did you feel and, and how did those feelings um, allow you to take them into you know, your time and your experiences that took place outside of Penn State after you went on into your career. And, you know, even in just some basic things that, that those experiences could have helped you understand or also g giving you a greater perspective on um, when you went into the real world. Cause you mentioned that it was a micro uh, microcosm um, at Penn State for going out into the real world. That is an excellent question. How I felt was pretty much what I expected. I said, they don't care. You know, they're trying to protect themselves. Um, they're looking out for themselves. They don't care what happens to us just long as whatever happens doesn't hurt the university or the university's reputation. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that, we decided that we would do, so we knew what the university's soft spot was, their reputation. So we said, we're gonna hurt, hit them where it hurts. And that was what we did with our activism. Mm -hmm. And we went to the papers, we went, you know, we went anywhere we, we could, everywhere we could and talked about what was going on. Mm -hmm. at Penn State, you know, and um, even years later in the early 70s, I was active with the university. Even though I was working, I had left the university and I came back. Um, a group of Black vets came up and a brother that was the leader of the Black vets, um, they, the university developed programs. We, one of the things that Coach Paterno spurned was we were allowed, they started this thing called EOP. Mm -hmm. We went, we spent our winter break 
going to Philly, Pittsburgh, and Harrisburg. And we went around and spoke at all the high schools and recruited. This was in the winter, fall in, between the fall and winter of 1969. Mm -hmm. We went around and spoke to students at a lot of the high schools in Philly, Overbrook, Germantown, Central, Franklin, Edison, um, maybe a few more schools. As a result, we had the largest influx of Black students ever at Penn State in the fall of 1969. Um, we were so involved in the program that we sat down and looked at um, um, the admissions. And I'm, I'm, I'm not answering the question yet, but this was um, how this, um, how our treatment spurred us to more action. We looked at the um, applications and a, a lot of white people were trying to, that were middle class that didn't need help. Like one guy, his father owned a string of drugstores and he tried to come in as a disadvantaged student because he had been lazy in high school. And the students that we um, marked to come in were students who were excellent students mm -hmm. and whom we had, with whom we had spoken. We, um, and they were admitted. And then I came down to Philly and brought two busloads of students up or three busloads of students up. And they spent a weekend up there at Penn State in um, the spring of 1969. Just about all of those students matriculated in the fall of um, 1969 at Penn State. Um, and what that told me is when I went out into the world, I ended up working for a company in Belfont. I worked for West Bend Power. I was the first black person ever to work there. And because that was in that center county, central Pennsylvania area, you know, there were people there that looked at me sideways. But again, my work ethic won them over. I worked at another company called Cerro Copper and Brass in Belfont. I was the only black person out of 1500 people working there. As a result of my work ethic, and um, I was threatened, I mean, really threatened a couple of times. And, you know, I was from the city, I didn't back down. You know, I had played football, I did not back down, you know. And again, I can't tell you some of the things that happened, but as a result, I ended up being respected in that environment. And just as an aside, Belfont, yeah, I'm sure you know Belfont from living in State College. You know what their greatest claim to fame is? Is it the Have, KKK? Pardon? Is it the KKK, their membership? No. Oh. Belfont's biggest claim to fame is that the Mills brothers are from mm -hmm. Belfont. Now, your grandparents or your parents may have heard of the Mills Brothers. Have you ever heard of them? When you get a chance, look up the Mills Brothers. They were a extremely popular singing group, black singing group in the 40s and 50s. And Belfont people are proud of the fact that they were, because they were the only people from Belfont that had ever become famous. And they were black. And they were probably the only one of two black families in Belfont or in that whole region. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and so it's ironic that, that that's the case. But uh, uh, going from that aside, every time I went into a job, uh, I went into a number of jobs, even after I came um, to, to Philly, where that was that period where they were just starting to hire black folks. Um, having been able to survive at Penn State made it really easy to survive in any of those work environments after Penn State. Mm 
-hmm. whether it was in Center County or whether it was in Philadelphia or even here in New Jersey. And, um, you know, I hear people complaining about work and all. And, you know, I don't want to throw, well, you should have been there when I first started. They don't care about that. But what I care about is they don't take it for granted that, you know, they are in a position to um, um, work like that. I went up to Penn State. When I was at Penn State, everybody Black spoke to anybody else Black. Mm -hmm. I went up to visit. I, I've gone up a number of times. I noticed that maybe by the late 90s or maybe early 2000s, when you went up there, if you spoke to somebody Black, they looked at you funny. Why are you speaking to me? I don't know you. You know, because now, as opposed to 200 or 180, which there were when I started, there were now a couple thousand on campus. So, you know, it was not a big thing to see somebody Black. Um, one other thing that led to my activism was we, we had a mentoring program. There were a group of brothers um, that came up from Philly one year, one of the years, maybe 69, maybe 70. And some of them were from Germantown and some of them were from Edison. Mm -hmm. And they were getting ready to fight. You know, they were bringing that gang mentality to state college. So there was a group of us that got our nickels and dimes together. We went and found these guys and said, you know, how you doing? And they said, you know, um, y'all can go on and pack your bags and we'll give you bus fare home. He said, we aren't going to have that blank up here. You know, if you want to stay up here and you want to make this, and, you know, I'm, I'm making the words a lot gentler than the way. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, if, if you're going to bring that here, you go back home and y'all can kill each other for all you can. If you're going to come up here, you're going to come up here and um, do something. Mm -hmm. And you know what? None of them took that bus fare. A lot of them be, ended up becoming best friends. And that's what we encourage. So a lot of times when new people first came to Penn State, you know, coming from the city, you don't speak to everybody back. You'd be speaking all day and your head be going <laughs> around in circles. But when they came to Penn State, if you spoke to somebody and they didn't speak back, we would step to them and say, look, this is the situation up here. Somebody, you see somebody back, just acknowledge them. You don't have to like them or anything, just acknowledge them. Mm -hmm. And that was the um, attitude that we had. So you will see that attitude in everybody that was there, at least from the mid 60s up to the mid 80s, you know. Yes, that has been a common theme throughout the interviews. Everyone has said that um, you guys, since it was such a small number of um, you guys, um, speaking of African Americans, at the time, you you all were able to build community, whether it will be through um, Black Greek life or if it was just through other organizations. So um, as we kind of wrap up the interview, I do have like three more questions I want to ask you, one pertain, pertaining to the Black Arts Fest. I don't know if you graduated in spring 19, um, six, 1969. Hold on. I did not graduate. Okay. I finished. Um, that's a whole nother story. Okay. I went on and had an extremely, I've been blessed, had an extremely successful career as first an engineer for the power company and then as a um, network engineer. I um, developed the first email system that the US Mint had. I developed a lot of um, things that the Treasury Department used. Um, my career got in my, the way of my finishing because they, 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 they would test you and the test came out really well. And they said, well, can you start? No, we'll pay for you to finish school. Well, I got up, caught up in helping people going to school. So I just kept working and they just kept throwing money at me and more money and more money and more money that I had never dreamed that I would make, you know. So I was blessed in that way and I never finished. 
So I lived up in State College until 1984. I worked for the um, power company as a planning engineer. I worked for West Penn and then um, as a control systems person at um, Ciro. I first I worked as a union person and then I worked on control systems mm -hmm. for the machinery that they had. Um, wow. And yeah, so, so I you wanted had to completely, get Yeah, completely different uh, trajectory, but it, it all happened through your time at Penn State. Um, did, yes. did you did you attend Black Arts Fest, which was May 69? Absolutely. I was part of the planning. Oh man. The Black Arts Festivals were legendary. They were go ahead. No, that was, you can go ahead and talk about it. Yeah, I was just gonna ask, like, what was your oh, experience? What, what was one event that you enjoyed most? <laughs> it, it's hard. The, 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 the Black Arts Festival Committee was thorough. We had concerts, we had workshops. It was, I don't remember details. That was a year or two ago, but mm -hmm. you know, I remember the concerts, really enjoying the concerts, being in the auditorium with a whole bunch of, of black people Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, that might have been the year that was the 19, okay, the 1969, I'm thinking of 1970, but um, 1969, it was just a time that was full of joy. You just felt real positive. You felt empowered. Um, you go to these workshops. That's all everybody was talking about. Um, the, the workshops, the displays, just everything and i don't remember the details all the details other people can probably tell you but all i can tell you is it was a time of joy for black people at penn state it was yes wow it was another way to bring you guys and together and also highlight the black community and um just from hearing from the other interviewees it was it, it was an opportunity to showcase to the university um that they should appreciate black culture black art black um Black history, uh, because it is a part of American history. So just to jump to our last and final two questions, um, focusing on lifetime um, memories and legacy. Like I said, you kind of hit on that Penn State was a microchasm for your experience going out into the real world. So what would you have looking doing this interview and looking back now, what is one thing or maybe two things that you would have told your 17 you know, 17, 18, 19, 20 year old self um, <laughs> during your time in college? Mm. One, stay focused. Don't let anything that's going on around you distract you. Participate, but stay focused mm -hmm. on your goal. I did not have enough focus. I was distracted. I was actually distracted by my activism. You know, I still managed to get through, but at that point, there were a lot of people that were active. They were, they participated in the activism and they were focused. I would tell myself, stay focused on your career goals. Mm -hmm but be active that's that's the main thing you know well i think that's so key uh especially being a during looking back at my freshman year and what i would tell myself i would tell myself to be a little bit more focused as well and you know not and procrastinate less i think i found myself you know many times many nights staying up all night doing work that didn't need to be you know, done at that time, but <laughs> I had used my time properly. But you know, you live and you learn. I still have a little bit of procrastination, but like I said, it's 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 something that I, I also can say I learned in college um, that has kind of helped me even in my current state now. So the final question, um, and it kind of taps into what you kind of said of staying focused and what you would remind yourself or what you would say to yourself at the age and during your your college years. Um, so if you would summarize your college experience in one word or one phrase, what would it be and why?
it was actually, it enlightened and expanded my perspective. Mm. I really learned to see the world through other eyes. Um, that was the enlightenment. Um, you know, I always had the African American perspective. Mm -hmm. Now, I started looking at the brothers on the street the way the white people were looking at them. And I said, that's the way they look at us. Mm -hmm. So that's the expanding um, portion of that experience because we, in my opinion, have an advantage. We can see the world through their eyes as a result of our experience at a place like Penn State. And we see the world through our eyes. Mm -hmm. So we have a broader view of the world. And it doesn't just apply to Caucasians, it applies to us, Asians, everybody that is different. We understand, um, I think we have, a, we, we understand different cultures. Mm -hmm. um, internally, you feel different cultures as opposed to just like, okay, they're different. They do this, they do that. Mm -hmm. We can feel it. I think we um, have a little bit more empathy for um, people. Okay, it developed empathy for other points of view, for other um, other people. Yeah. Well, I think that that is so powerful and enlightened enlightenment and expansion um, of the way that you think. And I think that college will surely do that for you. And going to Penn State has done yeah. that for you and probably has done, done that for me and probably several other students. So Mr. Biner, I just want to say thank you for sharing your experience. Thank you for telling your story about your experiences at Penn State. I believe that um, with you sharing your story that a lot of students, current students, a lot of fa current faculty, and also previous students who are now alumni will be able to resonate or, or find some way of uh, having a, a, a similar um, experience or understanding of what it was like being an African-American student at Penn State. Uh, whether it be during the 60s, during the 70s, during the 90s, during the 2000s, even during the time of 2021, because there are still a lot of racial issues that are reoccurring on campuses and at Penn State currently, and then also around the world. So thank you for just taking the time to be interviewed by me. It, it has been a pleasure and an honor listening to your story and you know being enlightened by your experience at Penn State. Can I say one more thing? After I left Penn State, when I would, was hearing about the racial issues that were going on, there was one person that I could call and I would get a really, really good idea of what the atmosphere was. And that was while he was still alive, Joe Paterno. I would call him every so often when something was going on. I, I had touch, it was in touch with other black students, so I'd had their perspective and then I would get his perspective because he could give me a perspective of the population in general. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a lot of respect. And so I'm just saying I had a lot of respect for him. So thank you. It was really good talk speaking with you. And if I wasn't so long winded, I could give you a lot more of experiences. You know, the Greek life was great. You know, um, that gave everybody a foundation just to let you know. I know, I'm sure other people have told you that, so I don't need to tell you that. It gave them a foundation. It didn't matter what organization you were in. That was like, you know, the Kappas were having a party or the Qs were having a party or the Deltas or the AKAs or whomever. Mm -hmm. So um, Zetas, whomever. So that's a little aside. So again, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks. I'm honored that you interviewed me. And, you know, good luck with your project.